This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. In Harvard, in the second half of the 20th century, two political philosophers reached apparently diametrically opposed conclusions about how society should be governed. Their theories remained deeply influential. John Rawls said that the just society would be the one governed by principles we'd agree to if we didn't know what position in society we occupied, principles chosen from behind what he famously termed the veil of ignorance. Robert Nozick, by contrast, was a libertarian. Nozick thought only a minimal state was warranted, and the state had no right to interfere with any agreements freely made by individuals, even if such agreements led to massive inequality. The conclusions of both men have tended to be interpreted by their disciples as universal, as applying to all societies. And the works of both men put little emphasis on history, on the origins of terms which pepper their writings, terms like justice, the social contract, rights. In his book Philosophy and Real Politics, Raymond Goyce argues that Rawls and Nozick did at least have one thing in common, their profoundly misguided approach. Raymond Goyce, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you very much. Good morning. The topic we're going to focus on today is the relationship between political philosophy and history. Many philosophers begin their work on political philosophy with a kind of abstract notion of what a human being is and then come up with a theory that seems almost independent of history. Do you think that's a good way of going about it? My own view on how to do political philosophy was very much influenced by a reading of Marx, of the early Marx. And I was particularly influenced by the passage in the German ideology in which Marx says there will in the future be only one science, the science of history. Everything else will be part of the science of history. Now, in the 60s, when I was growing up, there was a long discussion about the role of human nature and theories of human nature in Marx. Some people said Marx had to have a theory of human nature because the whole theory of alienation would not work if you didn't have a normative theory of human nature. Other people said Marx can't have a theory of human nature because he thinks that human nature is essentially a product of social circumstances or of history. So there were those two views that opposed each other very strongly. And my view has always been that both of those are incorrect and that you can only understand Marx and then also only understand the correct approach to political philosophy if you see in what way one of those views was right in some respects and the other view was also right in some respects but also wrong in some respects. So which one was right? Well, Marx clearly did think that there was a human nature, if you meant by human nature, simply that there were any number of interesting, general, empirical propositions you could support about how human beings acted everywhere. So he thinks that it's a true generalization about human beings, that we have to eat in order to live. He thinks there are lots of things like that. So if you want to call that a theory of human nature, he clearly does have a theory of human nature. It's just that he thinks that that theory of human nature is essentially a kind of empirical theory. That's the first thing he thinks. It's not a priori. It's not connected with any notion of reason. Second, he thinks that, as a matter of fact, that theory of human nature is too weak ever to give you specific moral or political advice in particular circumstances, in the sense that there are some things you can truly say about human nature. He thought there was a human nature, in the sense that you can't draw from that theory of human nature anything interesting about any real political problem. In that sense, he thought there wasn't any human nature. And yet, most of the history of political philosophy has been based on notions like the social contract in Hobbes, for instance, where you imagine what it would be like to take a human being and put them in this kind of experimental environment where there are no rules, and then try and deduce from that what kind of a society we ought to have now. Oh, yes, there's no doubt that that is the dominant trend and tradition in the history of political thought. I'm not saying, as it were, that this position, which I attribute to Marx and which I want to endorse, is part of that tradition of political philosophizing. It precisely breaks with that tradition. It says, if you want to do politics, don't make imaginary constructions about possible circumstances and imagine what people would do in those circumstances, because it says, in doing that, you're just deceiving yourself. You think you're abstracting from everything around you. You think you're getting to some 
absolutely firm set of assumptions that must be made normatively about everyone. But in fact, you'll never know when you're smuggling in what happen to be accidental features of your society and promoting them from being accidental features of your society to being essential elements of all human society. It isn't so much that there isn't anything that is universal. It's that you're never going to know in any particular circumstance whether what you observe around you is part of something that might be universal or whether it's actually just something accidental. You're never going to know. And if you don't know that, then assuming that you can set up these ideal thought experiments is just a way of reinforcing the status quo. So if you're right, then two of the allegedly great late 20th century political philosophers, John Rawls and Robert Nozick, just got it completely wrong because both of those thinkers in their own way began by abstracting from the actual conditions of society and talked about, in Nozick's case, individuals having rights, that's basic, and in Rawls's case, what kind of values would we choose if we didn't know the position we occupied in, in our society? Yes, in a way, it's easier to see what's wrong with Nozick than it is to see what's wrong with Rawls, because Nozick was a very, very bright man and, as it were, knew what he was doing. Namely, he begins his book by saying, I'm going to make a certain assumption. That's the assumption that every individual has rights and there's something you can't do to me without violating my rights. That's an assumption. I'm not going to talk about that any further. I'm just going to go on. Now, that's very, very honest, and, you know, I admire it for that. But precisely that honesty shows that there's nothing of any general normative significance associated with that because there are lots of societies in which the very conception of an individual right that was inviolable was unknown. In ancient societies, people didn't have conceptions of rights like this. So it seems to me that's a good instance of the sort of thing I think is a bad way to start. You start by looking around our society, noticing that we have a very complicated theory of rights. That theory of rights is connected with certain social features of our society. It might even be the case that we couldn't run our society without a doctrine of rights. I'm not denying that. But that's a different claim from the claim that rights is a kind of absolute starting point. And what about rules? Where did he go wrong? I dislike talking about rules because it, it's become a form of theology in which people spend their whole life fighting about the scholastic interpretation of particular sentences in the corpus at particular times. And I, I must say, I can't do that sort of thing. I'm not sufficiently interested in the project. But what seems to be basically wrong is the idea that you can have a veil of ignorance that will be somehow really neutral, that you can think about society and you can think about us as blanking out from ourselves some things that are irrelevant and leaving only the things that are relevant. And when you've done that, you can imagine what a group of people who had done that could discuss politics, and the idea then would be that you could come to some conclusion about that. And my view is that if you take seriously a really important feature about human society, which is that we're often deceived about what is relevant. We often don't know what is relevant. If you take that seriously, then you can't start from the assumption that, well, clearly we know that certain things are not relevant and other things are relevant. We can put the veil of ignorance down in exactly such a way that you don't know the things that are irrelevant and you do know the things that are relevant. What I'm saying is that exactly that distinction between the relevant and the irrelevant is presupposed by the theory, and that should be the thing you should begin to think about. To go back to Nozick, what you're saying is that because there are societies which historically or maybe even at the present have no conception of rights, Nozick must be wrong to start from that position that human beings have rights. What he might be allowed to do is start from the position that within his society there's a great history of the notion of an individual right which dominates the way that society has been constructed. The way you've put it brings out a possible difficulty in my position very clearly, and so I'd like to try to address that. The possible objection could be, well, look, the Greeks didn't have a lot of things. They didn't have the concept of penicillin, but it doesn't follow from the fact that they didn't have the concept that it's not an important one. There are kangaroos, even though the Greeks had no word for a kangaroo. There were kangaroos in the 4th century BC. The Greeks had no conception of kangaroo. It strikes me as very, very 
much more implausible to say. The Greeks had no concept of a right, and yet rights still somehow were there. Right is a concept that only makes sense relative to a, a given set of social institutions. There might be some things that were part of their institutions for which they didn't have a term. Aristotle says that very clearly. He says there are these various virtues, and look, there's this virtue. We don't have a word for that. So there might be individual things. But if you have a whole society which is organized without one of these central concepts, you'd need a very, very strong argument to convince me that the concept of right was still somehow there, even though they didn't see it, in the way in which the kangaroos were clearly there, although the Greeks didn't have a word for kangaroo. Of course, there is a tradition which provides some grounding for that. There's the notion of a God-given right. Many people do believe that rights are ultimately given by the deity. Absolutely. If you have a theological view, then you have a perfectly coherent view. I don't happen to think it's true, but if you think there is an entity called God, he created the world, he created the world in a particular way, he endowed us all with these rights, that's a perfectly coherent view. Then we'd have to talk about theology, as it were. Then the discussion shifts, it seems to me. Now, Kant, of course, tried to run this basically theological project, replacing God with reason. I find the, the appeal to God coherent. I don't find it very plausible. I find the replacement of God by the concept of pure reason even less plausible, because if you have problems with the notion of a right, you're going to have the same problems with the concept of reason. Again, I come back to my point. You can have a concept of reason that's universal, but that concept is going to be so empty that it's not going to allow you to bake any bread. And if you want to have a concept that does allow you to break bread, you're going to have to have a concept of reason that's more historically specified and contentful. That to me sounds quite Nietzschean in the sense that you're giving a genealogy of how a concept that we have now came to be as it is, as he did in the genealogy of morality, for instance. Yes, I don't want to deny that. I think that, in fact, most of the concepts that we use in politics democracy, republic, rights, authority, are concepts that really don't make any sense unless you understand them in their political context and understand them in their historical context. And so I think that the historical study can play a tremendously important role in allowing us to become clear about the way we structure our world and the way we structure our thoughts about the world. I can imagine devoting some time to studying the history of the notion of human rights. And I might believe there's a right not to be tortured. And yet, in another society which has a different history, which maybe doesn't have the notion of rights, human beings are regularly tortured. And that really bothers me as somebody who thinks that human beings have a right not to be tortured. I don't understand how on your model I could ever be justified in intervening to stop the torture in that other society. I might not have an answer to that, but I think there is a way to make a bit of progress in thinking about that question by realizing that there are a number of different issues there. One issue is the issue of my own moral reaction to something. So I might have a very strong moral reaction to the effect that it's wrong for people in China to be tortured. In fact, I do have that moral intuition. I might actually even have the moral intuition that it's wrong for people anywhere to be tortured. And I don't see that that's incompatible with my thinking that in the past there were plenty of societies in which people were tortured. And now you might ask, well, do I want to say they were wrong or not? And no, I don't want to say they're wrong or right. Morality is like the visual field. Certain things you can see clearly, but eventually at the end it becomes blurry. It seems to be perfectly fine for me to say I think it's wrong for people in China or in Latin America or in Guantanamo Bay to be tortured. And I might say, well, Roman legal practice was completely different. I don't want to endorse it. I also don't want to criticize it in the same way in which I criticize something that my contemporaries might do. I think there are two different things. Moral judgments in the first instance are directed to people with whom we have continuing interactions and whose 
action we can affect and who will be affected by our action. Once we have that, we can extend the notion of moral judgment from those cases to further and further cases. But by the time you get back to the past, the extension of the notion of a moral judgment makes a moral judgment about something that was in the far past in which you can have no effect a very, very different kind of thing. It's almost a qualitatively different kind of thing from the kind of moral judgment I make about my contemporaries. And then if you think that, then you also think that there's a difference between the moral reaction I might have and the actual action I might perform. I don't need an argument for having the moral reaction that I do. I don't have to justify that. You have to somehow give me an argument to the effect that I'm having the wrong reaction there. On the other hand, if I want not just to have a moral reaction and judge something, but I want to intervene in a particular way, then I might have to give a positive reason for that. So that makes those two cases rather different too. You know, the relativist generally presents us with a view of human life which seems to be completely wrong. The view of human life as, well, here we are, we don't know anything, and now we have to have reasons for everything. But that's not the way my life works. It isn't that I need reasons. I've got too many reasons for everything, and you have to somehow help me put them down. And if you think about it that way, then it seems to be much less likely that you'll even be tempted to think about relativism. You'll be tempted to think, of course, that you should be very careful if you invade a foreign country far away. With You'll damn well better think pretty carefully about that. But that's not a question of relativism. That's a differently structured question, it seems to me. I can understand why, because of the way I've been brought up, I value freedom of speech, and that in some societies freedom of speech is not valued highly. There are different stories about why people in those other cultures don't value free speech highly, but I still think they're wrong. And if I were to accept your line of reasoning, I might be much more tolerant of their difference from me than I would otherwise be. And I think that would be a shame, because I think I'm right. It doesn't seem to me that there's anything incoherent about both thinking that other people have a different form of life and thinking that they're wrong about that form of life. Perhaps I might say a little something about the genetic fallacy, because this is an issue that comes up in these things a lot. The kind of history of philosophy that I'm interested in is not a history of philosophy that says that you refute things by reference to their history. That, I take it, is what the genetic fallacy says. By virtue of seeing that it has this history, we can see that it's not right. That's not my view in the least. My view is the role of history doesn't tell you what's valid or what's not valid. It gives you understanding. That's one thing. And second, it sometimes changes the question you would like to ask. Genealogy is a way of changing the topic, changing the question, not a way of refuting something. So if you take the example of rights, the genealogical understanding of the way in which the concept of right gets established is not a way of showing that rights discourse is somehow incoherent. That's not what it's trying to do at all. What it's trying to do is to shift the question from what is the justification for an absolute theory of rights to the question, rights are an important part of the apparatus of this society. Why? What connection might there be between those rights and particular institutions? And what reasons might people have, if they're living in a society with those institutions, to think that a regime of rights is a good thing? The history there doesn't refute anything. It shifts the question. It moves it from a rather uninteresting question, it seems to me, what is the universal justification of rights, to a more historically specific question. Here we are, we've got these institutions, we've got these rights. Is that a good way to proceed? We've talked about some of the thinkers in the history of political thought who have perhaps gone too far down the route of trying to understand the human being in abstraction and then joined up together in a society as if we were atoms into molecules. Which are the thinkers that you would say are in the tradition that you respect and admire, the ones that will contextualise the individual sufficiently to ask the right questions? Hegel, Marx, Max Weber, Foucault. Raymond Goyce, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.